We are continuing on, folks. This is Dr. Jenkins, and here we are moving on to the digestive system. So we're going to have the digestive system, which is this video, and then next we have metabolism, and they kind of go hand in hand, but we're going to start off with digestive. Here we go. That is, if anyone doesn't already know, Mr. Joey Chestnut, multi-time winner of the mustard belt. I mean, what does he eat? How many hot dogs does he eat in 10 minutes? 60, 70? It's absolutely disgusting. <laughs> that would certainly be very taxing on the digestive system, now wouldn't it? Okay. Um, so when it comes to the digestive system, I think, and I hope you do as well, that it's pretty straightforward. You know, when it comes to the stomach and the small intestine, the esophagus, we tend to be able to visualize it. Um, you know, we can see, okay, the food goes from the mouth into the pharynx, into the esophagus, into the stomach. So we are going to cover a lot of structures and you still have to study, of course. So please continue to study. But I think the benefit of this chapter is that it's straightforward. Hopefully that's the case. Here's our outline. We'll talk about the functions, and then we're going to talk about the anatomy. As we go through each organ, we'll talk about the organ's basic structure and its function. Here we go. Make sure you review all of the functions. And these kind of happen in order, so we can see um, how these happen from one to the other. We have to bring in the food. We have to mechanically break it down through mechanical digestion. We have to chemically break it down through chemicals. And then we, involved in the process of chemical digestion is secretion. We need to have the ability to produce and secrete enzymes to help us chemically break down the nutrients. Once the nutrients have been broken down completely, then we can absorb them. Notice we're absorbing nutrients from the inside of the small intestine wall into the bloodstream because once we absorb nutrients into the bloodstream, then the bloodstream is like a highway. It's a super highway that can carry all these lovely nutrients to all cells of the body. Whatever is undigestible, we form into a nice little package and then we poop it out. All right. Um, okay. I want to spend a little bit more time on this screen. Make sure that we can define digestion and absorption. So even though it's above, let's just make sure we have it very clear. The word digestion in the digestive system means to break down. When you bring in a big old hunk of food, we have to break it down into smaller pieces. Of course. So digestion just means to break down into smaller pieces. We can digest either through mechanical means or through chemical means. Mechanical digestion would be mm -hmm. to break down through mechanical forces, such as chewing. Chemical digestion would be to break down using chemicals. What kind of chemicals? Enzymes. There we go. And then absorption, as I already said, after we digest things and break them down into their smallest pieces, only then can we absorb them. They're absorbed through the GI tract wall into the bloodstream key right there into the bloodstream and that's where the bloodstream can now transport all these nutrients all throughout the body it's a fantastic thing so make sure you know all these functions make sure you can define digestion and absorption specifically all right we're going to begin to go through the anatomy of the digestive system. And we're gonna break down the digestive system into two parts. We have the digestive tract. 
sometimes called the, maybe you've heard the alimentary canal. The digestive tract is the path that food takes. Mouth, pharynx, esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, whatever is left, rectum, and anus. This is the tract, the succession of organs where food passes through, what food passes through. Then we have some accessory organs. The accessory organs sit outside the digestive tract. The liver, the gallbladder, and then the pancreas, which is behind the stomach. Liver, gallbladder, pancreas. These sit outside the digestive tract, which means that food does not pass through them directly. However, these organs are still very important because what the accessory organs do is they produce enzymes. So even though food doesn't directly pass through the liver, still really important. Even though food doesn't directly pass through the pancreas, the pancreas is still very important. Overall, if I were to give you a combined function of the accessory organs, produces enzymes. Those enzymes will lead into the digestive tract. They just don't, they're not in a place where food passes through. Okay. Here we go. We're going to go through the main digestive tract organs, the main accessory organs. For each, we're going to talk about the structure and function. But first, but first, this picture covered it up, I'm sorry. We have to talk about the GI tract wall. So what we're talking about, GI tract, so these are the organs that food passes through. Excuse me. These are the organs that food passes through, such as the esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine. This picture here, we're looking at the esophagus. Well, all we're saying here is that the, the structure of this small intestine wall is really important. The food's going to be in the middle, right? But the wall that surrounds it is very important. And the main structure of this GI tract wall is consistent. So we have many, of course there's some differences, but we have many of the same structural components in the GI tract wall, no matter if it's the esophagus or the stomach or the small intestine. Make sure you familiarize yourself with the four layers of the digestive tract wall. All GI, excuse me, all GI tract organs have the same four layers in their wall. No matter if it's the esophagus or the stomach or the small intestine or large intestine. Just know the layers. Some of the specifics of these layers will be different. For example, the muscular layer of the stomach has three layers. The muscular layer of the esophagus and large intestine only has two layers. For example, the outer serosa is thicker in the esophagus. It's thinner in the small intestine stomach. So there's some variations, but no matter the GI tract organ, not the accessory organs, but the GI tract organs, same four layers. Let's do it. The inner layer is called the mucosa. In this picture, the mucosa goes up and down. What is the benefit of that? More surface area. Look at how much green that is. Instead of just being like this, it's like this. If I, was, if I was to extend out the windy one, it would be much longer. So the benefit of having that pattern 
is more surface area. So the inner layer of the GI tract wall is a layer called the mucosa. This is where we will see a lot of the absorption and secretion. You only have to know what is starred, so we need to know the four layers, and then you need to know what is underlined. So for the mucosa, all you need to know is that it is the innermost layer. Then we have the submucosa, which I'm going to highlight in yellow. The submucosa has this beige color to it, and it has blood vessels. That's how I know it's the submucosa. It's got all those blood vessels. So what's unique about the submucosa, it is the next layer. The mucosa is the innermost. Then moving outward, we have the submucosa, which contains a lot of the blood vessels. What other, can I, what other color can I use? It's kind of fun to do this. Let's go with pink. Be nice and bright. Then we have the muscularis. Oh. It's not going to be a good color. I know what color I can use. White. Okay. Simple joys. You know, sometimes you just have fun. Here we go. <laughs> the muscularis externa is what I'm coloring in white. I think by now we know what muscle looks like. It has that reddish color to it. It has those striations. Well, technically, smooth muscle doesn't have striations, but if I look at it, it kind of looks, kind of looks that way. Point is, it is this whole layer, muscularis externa. We're going to talk about peristalsis, how the muscle in the esophageal wall rhythmically contracts to help push the food down. Excellent. And then our outermost layer, let's do purple. Our outermost layer is called the serosa. It's not very thick, but it's strong. What I have in purple here is the serosa. Not necessarily very thick, but it's strong. All right, so know the four layers. Innermost layer of the GI tract wall, mucosa. Then we have the submucosa containing blood vessels. Then we have the muscularis externa, as the name suggests, containing muscle. Then we have the serosa outer covering. All right. Okay, now we're going to go down the GI tract, organ by organ. You should know the basic structure and basic function. Here we go. And I'm sorry, the arrows didn't show here. But these are the organs in order, the path that food and food stuff takes. Everything starts in the mouth. You can, you'll see it called mouth, or you'll see it called oral cavity. Either one is okay. The function, let me go back to the green. The function of the mouth is mechanical digestion. Of course, we can chew. That's breaking things up, breaking them down mechanically. The mouth will do mechanical digestion of all nutrients. And guess what? The mouth can actually do some chemical digestion, but only of starch. Starch is a complex carbohydrate, so we want to get a head start on breaking it down chemically. So the function of the mouth, mechanical digestion of all nutrients, chemical digestion of starch only. We have salivary glands in and around the mouth, which, of course, produce our saliva. The saliva helps to moisten things as we break them down. The saliva contains the enzyme to help break down starch. Anything I don't talk about, you don't have to know. Here are those salivary glands. You don't need to know them specifically. There are three. You don't need to know these. In case you're wondering, I've labeled them on this drawing. They look, or this picture, they look like those um, yellow bubbly stuff. Look at how much we produce. One to one and a half liters of saliva each day. That is a lot of saliva, folks. <laughs> you don't need to know that number, but I'm just telling you that our mouth is pretty juicy. 
which you probably already know. And as I said before, in addition to the saliva moistening the food to help break it down, the saliva contains the enzyme for starch. That's the only way that we're able to mechanically digest starch. We can only mechanically digest it by having the enzyme. All right, so we started in the mouth, and the next region is the pharynx, otherwise known as the throat. So the region from there to about there is the pharynx. Please don't say throat, say pharynx. Something unique, sorry for that noise there, something unique that I want to point out about the pharynx you know, other parts of the GI tract wall, we talk about that muscularis externa layer. Most muscular externa layers are made up of smooth muscle, which is involuntarily controlled. However, one of the unique things about the pharynx wall is that the muscularis externa layer is made up of skeletal muscle. And this is because we want to be able to voluntarily swallow. Once we get down into the lower parts of the esophagus, your esophagus takes over, right? You don't have to voluntarily do the whole thing, but leaving your mouth, you want to have the skeletal muscle surrounding the pharynx to help voluntarily swallow. What is the function of the pharynx? It is simply a passageway. There's no additional digestion happening. It's just a passageway. By the way, once the food mass moves from the mouth into the pharynx, it is now called a bolus. It's kind of a weird name, but now it's no longer solid food. It's a food mass. We've broken it down a little bit and we've added some saliva. Okay, and straightforward, basic structure, basic function. So we started off in the oral cavity, then we got to the pharynx, and now we're into the esophagus. Esophagus, muscular tube leading from the pharynx into the stomach. Its function, folks, is similar to the pharynx, is the passageway. In case you're wondering, the upper parts of the esophagus the muscularis externa is smooth mus skeletal muscle. And then as we get down to the middle and lower regions of the esophagus, the mu muscular layer is smooth. So it starts off skeletal in the upper region for voluntary. But very quickly, the smooth muscle takes over and it will push food down through peristalsis. So imagine, you know, we swallow food in chunks. So this is one chunk of food that someone swallowed. And this is another chunk of food that someone swallowed. And the esophageal wall contracts rhythmically. So maybe pieces of the muscular wall contract there and it shoots the food down. A little bit later, actually right afterwards, we contract here and it shoots the food down. So peristalsis is that rhythmic contraction from high to low that pushes the food down. What's interesting of this x-ray picture after someone swallowed is we can also see that when there's not food in the esophagus, it's pretty much flat, but it has the ability to stretch. So if there's no food in the esophagus, it's flat, but once we shove food in it, the esophageal wall is allowed to expand. As an FYI, you don't have to know this, but it's just an FYI, it only takes about five seconds for the food to get from the pharynx to the stomach. Pretty quick passageway. We have an anatomical structure called a sphincter. A sphincter is a thickened area of muscle. We have already established that we have muscle in the entire GI tract wall. It's in that muscularis externa layer. 
We have muscle the whole way around. We, can we see that? Yes. We got muscle all the way around. But in some areas, the muscle is thicker. So look right here. I'm not sure those arrows are exactly pointing to it because the sphincter is right here. Do you see how the muscle got thicker there and thicker there? An area where that smooth muscle is thicker is called the sphincter. And what this sphincter does is it opens and closes to regulate movement. We have to have a, a way to move food from one organ to the other. It can't just be always open. <laughs> we can't just have the food move exactly through in a split second, mouth, pharynx, esophagus, stomach, small, small intestine, large intestine, rectum, anus. But we gotta have the food stay in some of these organs so the organs can do their job. So the way that we keep food, for example, the way that we keep food in the stomach when we swallow, when we swallow, this lower esophageal sphincter relaxes. When this sphincter is relaxed, food can go through. But this sphincter is only going to relax when you swallow. If you are not swallowing, if you're not swallowing, the sphincter contracts together completely. The reason why it's closed when we're not swallowing is because we don't want stuff in the stomach to come back up. That's what acid reflux is. Reflux is. So once we open the sphincter so food can travel through, then we close it. And that will effectively keep the food in the stomach. So these sphincters are thickened areas of muscle of, that are responsible for regulating movement of food. When these sphincters open, food goes through. When they close, food stays in the organ. There's also a sphincter between the stomach and the small intestine. We want that to be closed most of the time. You know, food is going to stay in the stomach for about two or three hours. And we want this sphincter to be closed so food will stay in the stomach for two or three hours. But once the stomach has effectively broken things down, then the sphincter will open. And just at the right time, food will move from the stomach into the small intestine. After that food moves into the small intestine, sphincter will close again. Good stuff. I mentioned peristalsis. Here is just a slide about, about it. Rhythmic contraction. Peristalsis is only going to be by smooth muscle. But this is how we push the food down. Peristalsis occurs in the esophagus. We do see some peristalsis also in the small intestine, but we're going to focus on the esophagus as our example. Rhythmic contraction that squeezes or pushes the food down. All right. So we brought food into the oral cavity, the pharynx, the esophagus. Now it's coming into the stomach. The stomach is a J-shaped organ, very muscular. What are some of the specific structures to know? One of them is the pyloric sphincter. That is the thickened area of muscle here, right at the junction between the small, excuse me, stomach. The pyloric sphincter is at the junction between the stomach and the small intestine. When it's open, food from the stomach, <clears throat> excuse me, when it's open, food from the stomach passes into the small intestine. When it's closed, food stays in the stomach. Straightforward, folks. What are the functions of the stomach? Stores food. As I said, I'm not going to ask you this exact number, but if you're wondering, 
Food is going to stay in the stomach for about two or three hours. While it's there, the walls of the stomach contract and they kind of churn the food like a washing machine. Therefore, the stomach does mechanical digestion of all nutrients because the stomach wall contracts in and then relaxes and it churns the food. Stores food, mechanical digestion of all nutrients. And then we can do chemical digestion of some nutrients. The only chemical, the only nutrient we can chemically digest in the stomach is protein. So these are the three main functions of the stomach. Stores food, mechanical digestion of all nutrients, chemical digestion of protein only. We do not absorb carbs, fat, or protein through the stomach wall. Whereas the food mass was called a bolus once it was swallowed, once we get to the stomach, now this food mixture is called chyme, C-H-Y-M-E. It's much more soupy. All right. What are some anatomical features that are important for the stomach? Well, in the mucosa, mucosa is the inner lining of the GI tract wall. In the mucosa, we have these folds. See these folds? They're called rugae. And they allow for stretch. If the stomach is empty, you're more likely to see those folds. When we eat and the stomach fills, the folds will smooth out. Also, even though you can't see it in the top picture, if we look between some of those folds or rugae, we can see these things called gastric pits. I love this name. Gastric means stomach. Pit means, you know, pit. So we see these gastric pits. And they contain little cells on the side. And what those cells on the side do is produce hydrochloric acid and they produce the enzymes that help break down protein. So the juices that are produced in the gastric pits travel up the gastric pit into the inside of the stomach. The cells that line these gastric pits produce a pretty good amount of hydrochloric acid pretty good amount of the enzyme to break down protein. I mentioned hydrochloric acid that is produced by the cells that line the gastric pits. This is, from all accounts that I know, this is the substance in the body that has the lowest pH. 0.8, folks. The pH scale is 0 to 14. We are below 1. So, so acidic. Now, the inside of the stomach wall is built to handle that acidity. But the esophagus isn't. So remember the esophagus comes down. If that sphincter, the lower esophageal sphincter, isn't doing its job, what happens if some of that stomach juice comes back up? Acid reflux. The the esophageal wall is not built to handle that acidity, so it will feel like burning because it is burning through the esophageal wall. Not good. The function of hydrochloric acid, it activates enzymes and it kills some bacteria. It makes for a very inhospitable, inhospitable environment for these bacteria. And I want to point out hydrochloric acid itself isn't an enzyme but it activates enzymes. The stomach can also do peristalsis. We mentioned that peristalsis occurs in the esophagus, but it can also happen in the stomach. Look at that. All right, so we brought food in through the mouth, pharynx, esophagus, into the stomach. 
Now we get into the small intestine. The small intestine is thinner in diameter, but it is much longer. So it gets the name small because it's thinner in diameter. An average adult has about 18 feet of just a small intestine. Why is it so darn long? More surface area. We have a lot of nutrients to break down. All of our billions of cells need fuel. So we need to bring in a lot of food to fuel them. Make sure you're reviewing the things in red. The stomach, excuse me, small intestine. The small intestine has three regions. The very beginning region, some sources say six inches, some say 10 inches, half a foot to a foot. The beginning region is called the duodenum. Some say duodenum, I say duodenum. The next region is called the jejunum. And the final region is called the ileum. So from proximal to distal. The duodenum is the very much smaller region right off the stomach. Jejunum is next. Ileum is the most distal. What are the functions of the small intestine? Completes chemical digestion of all nutrients. Chemical digestion of all nutrients. Now this is important. If we think about it, let's put it all together. We began to chemically digest starch in the mouth. We began to chemically digest protein in, did I say that right? I'm sorry, I'm tired today. Let me just make sure I say that right. We began to chemically digest starch in the mouth. We began to chemically digest protein in the stomach. But that's it. We haven't even started to chemically digest fat. And we've only begun chemical digestion of the others. So the small intestine is where we do most of our chemical digestion. And we do chemical digestion of everything. Once chemical digestion has been complete, now the nutrients are in their smallest possible pieces and they are available through absorption. This is the organ where we absorb nutrients. Nutrients are absorbed through the small intestine wall into the bloodstream. Then the bloodstream can take all these nutrients to all the cells of the body. What are some of the unique characteristics of the small intestine? Well, in the mucosa, which is the inner lining, there are these long hairs. Each hair is called a villus, but the hair collectively are known as villi, hairs. This, my friends, is where the nutrients are absorbed through. Let's go with white. Nutrients are absorbed from inside the stomach wall through, I'm sorry, inside the small intestine, through the small intestine wall into the bloodstream. This is the organ of absorption. The benefit of having all these villi, more surface area. Pretty cool. All right, by the time we get to the large intestine, we've absorbed all the major nutrients. Remember, the small intestine is in here, and in the lower right quadrant of the abdomen is where the small intestine meets the large intestine. The large intestine is larger in diameter, but it's, small, it's shorter, excuse me, Larger in diameter, but shorter overall. By the time we get here, the nutrients that we wanted to keep have been absorbed. So what's left? A lot of waste products. So as we're going to find, one job of the large intestine is to form those waste products into little pieces that we can excrete out or poop. In terms of the anatomy... The little projection hanging off the beginning region of the large intestine is called the appendix. 
function is largely unknown. But it can be a problem because of the anatomy. Little bacteria can easily just get dislodged into it. Um, and it just kind of hangs there, so it can easily become inflamed. There are different regions if you're interested. You don't have to know the regions. If you wanted to know, the beginning region is called the cecum. Then we have the ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, and then sigmoid colon. These, all of these structures are one-way streets. Food's only going to move in one direction through the small intestine and through the large intestine. What is the function of the large intestine? We're going to cover two. Forms poop. We talked about that. But also, in the large intestine, we absorb a lot of water. One big function of the large intestine. Stor uh, forms poop reabsorbs water because this is you know we're right about we're right about to excrete waste but your body likes to reuse what it can so all that water that we the gastric juices that were largely water that contained hydrochloric acid maybe a bunch of enzymes we don't want to just poop that water out so a lot of that water gets reabsorbed into the bloodstream because we can reuse it. And that means that we only poop out something that's more semi-solid. Now, of course, if we have diarrhea, it's an indication that something has moved too quickly through our digestive tract. If something moves too quickly through our digestive tract, the body's not able to absorb enough. So we end up not absorbing enough water and we end up losing a lot of that water in poop. This is why someone that has diarrhea is at risk for dehydration because you're pooping out a lot of that water that would otherwise have been reabsorbed for the body to use. Lastly, we have the rectum, the holding tank for the poop, and the anus is the exit hole. Surrounding the rectum and anus, we have a set of sphincters. We're going to see a similar arrangement at the exit point from the bladder. So it's true of how we hold on to and then release urine as to how we hold on and then release poop. The internal anal sphincter is smooth muscle. This keeps things in involuntarily. So you don't have to constantly remember, hold poop in, hold poop in. I mean, we'd ultimately forget, wouldn't we? So it's good that the internal anal sphincter is smooth muscle, holds things in for us. And then the external anal sphincter is skeletal muscle. So that when we go to drop the kids off at the pool, go to the bathroom, the skeletal muscle of the external anal sphincter helps to push things out. You should know the internal is smooth muscle, the external anal sphincter is skeletal muscle. Um, just to make you laugh here, this will not be on a quiz or an exam, but this is what stool should look like. You all might laugh, everyone. Come on. Just like our dogs and cats, we can tell a lot about how things are functioning by what our poop looks like. Take a minute here. Well, less than that. What do you think would be considered normal on this stool chart? I'll tell you. Normal would be type 3 or type 4. Again, not going to be on a quiz, but it is kind of funny to read the descriptions. Type 3, like a sausage but with cracks on its surface. Type 4, like a sausage or snake, smooth and soft. <laughs> If we go towards this end, use this color, if we go down this end, we're talking more about diarrhea, which means that food moved too quickly through our body. Maybe you ingested, well, for example, if I went and had Taco Bell right now, I would have diarrhea. My body's not used to it. My body would try and get it out of, 
out of, out of the system as quickly as possible. So your body would purposely move things more quickly through the GI tract, meaning that your large intestine doesn't have enough time to reabsorb as, as much water, and what you poop out is watery. On the other hand, this is... Oh, Moving upward here, this is the way that we would talk about more constipation if food spends too long in the large intestine. If food spends too long in the large intestine, too much water is reabsorbed, leaving something much harder and more difficult to pass. Okay. So here is the timeline. You don't need to know these specifically. People just kept asking, so I put it together for you if you're wondering. But you don't need to know those. Okay, we're going to pause for a bit. Uh, in the second video, we will do the accessory organs, and we will talk about some specifics about how carbs, fat, and protein are digested and absorbed.